Welcome to Rising Tide Startups, where today's most exciting solopreneurs share their startup stories. They also deliver tangible strategies that they would implement personally if starting their business over today. Each episode is a startup masterclass. Make sure you take notes. Take it away, Kevin. This is Kevin Pruitt with another episode of Rising Tide Startups, and my guest today is Chris Godzog. Chris, thanks for joining us on Rising Tide. It's my pleasure, Kevin. So he is calling me literally from the other side of the planet. He's uh, sitting in Thailand right now and start the violins now. He's sitting on a beautiful island, probably five minute walk from a beach, or maybe he can see the beach outside the, the, the uh, room that he's standing in. But uh, Chris, share a little bit about yourself with our audience. I'd be happy to. I mean, uh, yeah, we're very lucky to be in Thailand. We left Canada and, and North Vancouver in December um, after my high school aged, uh, I've got three kids, uh, but one that was in his final year in high school. And we decided, let's see if we can't create a new, uh, situation for him in which his last year of high school would be a little more interesting. We came to Thailand and we live on an Island called Koh Lanta on the South uh, Andaman Sea, uh, a fantastic place to live. And he's had a great experience, uh, and is just finishing up his exams now. So we're here. Yeah, I can see the beach if I wanted to, but I'm happy to be here. <laughs> so is that close to Phuket? Is that, uh, it's kind of in that, yeah. in that area? It, it is. It's, it's in that area. Absolutely. It's in that area. It's, um, it, it's a little more remote and we picked in part because of the scuba diving and my son's now a, a dive master he got his uh, dive master certificate uh we were welcomed with open arms there in difficult times difficult times everywhere yeah. but the covid rates were very low when we arrived and we were able to live a fairly normal life and he completed his dive master course at uh, flip-flop divers in Koh Lanta, which i would recommend to anybody anytime as a free plug for the dive school there. And uh, yeah, he's, uh, he's not getting anything from this folks. He did it just, just pro bono, but uh, amazing people uh, on that Island, actually amazing place to live. It's been a great experience, but we'll be back in Vancouver pretty soon. So Chris, tell us a little bit about uh, your, your business background, kind of walk us through the journey there. And uh, you, you said a little off camera, it might be a little serendipitous, but uh, you know, or a little, uh, little serpentine movement there. So tell us a little bit. Well, I mean, I, I certainly didn't think I was going to be involved in business when I was in my early 20s. Um, I, and then I didn't even see the, my first project as a business venture. Um, a friend of mine named Keith Fitzpatrick, who's still one of my best friends, we decided to start a, a, a health organization in Montreal in 1995. And we just set out to, to kind of solve some problems that were in our own backyard, our own community. And, and really, when I look back, I think we we could have put an amazing deck together that would have talked about problem solution and <laughs> it would have been an amazing deck, but it, but, but it really was just the problems were pretty evident to us. And, and we were able to start an organization that was basically driven by young people making and delivering food to people living a lot, living with a loss of autonomy in their community. And we were solving problems like how to long before DoorDash, we were designing you know, delivery bags and how to deliver food to in, in the middle of winter at five o'clock. And the thing took off and it's now 25 years old. And, um, and it's a, you know, really it's an institution in Montreal in a lot of ways. And, but during the time um, uh, we, we developed a bunch of skills that I mean, hadn't really thought about at the time, which is how to raise capital and how to, um, how to execute on a business plan, all these things mm -hmm. that hadn't been a part of my life suddenly became things that were super interesting to me. And um, after running that organization for a few years, I set out to uh, to go into another industry that I was really interested, I was always interested in, which is the forest products in, in sector. And again, it was another one of those problem solution situations where the problem, this is around 2000, the problem that seemed obvious to me and to millions of people was that, you know, people love wood products, but they don't want to cut trees down. So right. our love for wood, it really conflicts with our, our, our need for, for living trees. And there's a really simple solution that was available. The route to get there was incredibly complicated, but the simple solution was that there are literally 300 million trees that are standing behind dam reservoirs around the world that were flooded. And most people don't even know about that, 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 uh, that, that, that there, are, there are trees and forests that are standing 
behind these dam reservoirs, completely flooded and completely preserved, completely preserved mm. underwater. And this is true in the United States. This is true in, in, uh, in Canada. It's true in Brazil. It's true in Malaysia. It's true all over the world. Same situation. You create a hydro dam, you flood the, the valley, you flood the trees, and then the trees are preserved. So this basic idea was why wouldn't you cut down a dead tree, one that isn't living or isn't habitat for animals, isn't sequestering carbon, cut down a dead tree and then make lumber out of that tree rather than cut down a living tree. That seemed like a simple idea. The execution piece is really complicated. I set out in, in 2000 to build a company to specialize in underwater logging, underwater forestry, robotic uh, underwater technologies. And, and, and I ran that company for 10 years and developed operations in Canada, the United States, Brazil, Malaysia, Africa. Uh, and I'm still a part owner of a, of a business that uh, that business was sold to Voltalia, a, a French uh, energy company um, called Triton Resources. But I, I still am a co-owner of an of a underwater logging operation in Ghana um, that uh, where we, we were harvesting timber that was underwater since 1964. Uh, it's tropical timber that um, we're able to then cut at our sawmill and sell all around the world as, I mean, a beautiful, perfect replacement for living from wood from living trees. And um, so we've really been able to fulfill that promise, which is why don't we, why don't we cut down trees that aren't living before we cut down trees that are that, that sort of thinking is really drives me more than anything when it comes to business opportunities, which is how do we, how do we look at, at um, the problem problem solution paradigm, you know, and, 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 and think about it not so much as, a, uh, a technical challenge. Sometimes it's also a social challenge or a, or a, even a political challenge. And how do you, and then how do you source the solutions in a way that makes sense? Um, and um, sometimes it takes a long, long time to source those solutions. In our case, building robotic technology that can cut trees in 200 feet of water is doesn't, it doesn't happen overnight. And yet the technical skills that are available, when you think about a menu of technical skills, it, the technical skills are all usually available. And this is right. true of almost any, any, any problem right now. It's a question of how do you then put the team together that can actually source those solutions and then start to execute in a, in a, in a way that, that, that makes, uh, mm -hmm. makes it viable. And that's usually one of the biggest challenges for, for entrepreneurs. I would say that my, uh, my, um, uh, naive approach to this in 2000 was one of my best assets that, I thought we That's could do true it a lot that that, it, uh, that that almost naivete that you have that says, you know what? I don't necessarily know what I don't know, but I, I got to break in here right now because I want to ask you a question. I mean, so there's yeah. this old joke that talks about, you know, what are you going to major in university? It's I'm going to major in underwater basket weaving. I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I kind of have this this mental image going on in your mind when you were telling the story and going, well, of course, you, you know, you're going to cut down trees in 200 feet of water. And I'm thinking. <laughs> oh sure you're gonna tell people what do you yeah. imagine underwater logging that's what yeah I, that's what i'm measuring you know that that uh um reminds me of pitching the business in silicon valley to some of the biggest investors in the world and starting the the, the pitch with i've got a feeling that you're going to tell me um you like this idea but we don't invest in underwater logging. Like there's a good <laughs> chance. Exactly. Yeah. We, we decided early on, we were never going to invest in this. Yeah, right. that, exactly. We thought about it. We looked at it. It's not for us. That's right. We're more into yeah. tech. That's exactly. exactly. We're more. And yet, tech. We, yet we raised $20 million from traditional venture capitalists. Why? Because we were solving a fundamental problem. Yep. How can you deliver? How can you deliver wood products to a big market? and create value using technology. Um, and do you have a great team? And are you, are you committed? You, are you really, really deeply committed? And that takes, us, takes, back, it takes me back to a leadership question, which in this conversation, I would say the biggest, the biggest issue at the end of the day ends up being leadership in most of these situations where um, uh, leadership often is about, you know, passion and, and confidence and, and willing to, to stand up and 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 lean into the wind, it, it, the the skills can be learned, right? But um, I'll talk about the, the, this theme if you want later. But the, I've worked with a bunch of leaders since, 
who've had the skills, but question whether or not they were the right leaders. And, mm. and sometimes it's just, it's just a question of saying, I, you know, what I have and my passion for this business is harder to replace than, than say the, the skills that, that, that somebody with an MBA will bring to the table. And um, I think that in raising capital for that, for Triton resources, one of the, one of the things we were able to do is really put a great leadership team together and, and we had the right approach. So, yeah, um, you're right. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't self-evident. I, 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 underwater logging is not a self-evident thing, but, but so uh, I ran that company for 10 years um, and it was then sold to Voltali in 2000 and I think 16 um, I was a consultant for um, a few years, not that the world needed another consultant, but I was asked occasionally to, to help entrepreneurs or emerging companies who were looking at innovation as a business model. That was something right. that I really, really believed in, right? It's how do you turn innovation into a business model? So you think about your ideas and your, uh, and your technology pathway or your roadmap to building something new, but you think of it as a business model. How do, how do we turn this a process of creating something new into something that will create value and, and how do we do it quickly and efficiently. Um, and so I've, I've worked with a number of entrepreneurs on, on that. And uh, how do you approach. time that right? I mean, you can, if and you're I too early, if you're too late, I mean, there, there is this equilibrium point that you've got to deliver right on the money because if you, you know, you can, you can have a great idea that the market just is not ready for, or you can be too late to the game and, you know, still have a great idea, but be too late to the game. So that's, I think that's a gift is figuring out that, that timing, that product market fit timing. I think think you're absolutely right. It is a gift. And there are so many stories of great ideas that were too early. And, um, and the other, the other, one of the challenges that entrepreneurs face is that they're, that most of the uh, kind of management science that's easy to access is about business cases that relate to success. So it's a, it, and, 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 and there are some interesting cases where they look at business cases where they're too early, but, um, but, you know, the, the being able to uh, think about the pitfalls of entrepreneurship is well, it's, is, is, is really harder to do. So as you're going through the process of evolving and growing and trying to find that product market fit, uh, sometimes I, I think that management science is a little behind the curve yeah. with, with entrepreneurship. And um, books. Especially, yeah. You know, books written yeah. on those subjects. Nobody wants to read a book. Yeah, you were too early. You know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you were too early or here, here's the 10 reasons why I failed. And there's no, you know. <laughs> 50 failures you want <laughs> to emulate. That's exactly, exactly right. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah. And, and, and. So my my uh, my career then um, landed with a, uh, a completely different industry. I am the co-founder and former CEO of Ziva, Dynam- Ziva Dynamics, ZIVA, which is a, a software company that um, uh, that uh, replicates uh, and represents muscles, fat, tissue, the muscular skeletal systems of human beings and other animals. And I co-founded that company with, with two people that um, really have a deep, deep background in this space. One is an Academy Award winner, and the other one is a, a professor at um, University of Southern California. And we built the company on the idea that um, in 3D graphics, uh, in computer graphics, there's a need to create fast simulations and fast representations of realistic things like you and I. Uh, as human beings or animals, anything that deforms in complex ways, like our faces are deforming right now as we talk mm. to each other. It's, oh, it's I know, really brother. Good... I, I feel you. <laughs> I feel it's, a complex, it's a complex problem. Yeah. And we build a software company that uh, in, for, in 2015 that today really is a category leader in this space. And um, I was uh, CEO from 2015 to 2019. And um, uh, and the company then onboarded its uh, its uh, sort of Series A investors, and um, and I stepped away to go back into the wood business that I've, I'm still still I was still involved in the time. But that business really was about bringing together in- incredibly talented people to solve very very complex problems in anticipation for what we all think is the inevitable. Uh, introduction of ubiquitous virtual humans mm, right. and and other other deforming things in a in a three D graphic world that's responding to physics in real time, and that that that's you know some people are, 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 have termed that 
inevitability is the metaverse. And I think that's the right way to describe mm-hmm. it. We're all heading towards a, an, a persistent, infinitely growing space online that will be represented through uh, a, a, a physics-based, um, uh, you know, computer-based, physics-based uh, uh, system where when you interact with that world, you are being represented by, by, by some kind of physical reality. Um, and, what a, uh, what a, what a, what an intersection of so many divergent technologies. I mean, you know, you feel like AI meets VR meets blockchain meets 3d yeah. meets. I mean, it's, it is, it, I mean, it's star Wars stuff. I mean, it really is. It's, I mean, and I can date myself. I'm pre star Wars, you know, so just the whole idea of the hologram, you know, yeah. um, the, the, you know, you can turn it 360 degrees and, and view it from any angle. And, uh, but yeah, I, I'm, this is your, this is your story, not mine. I am, I am anxious for you to an, unpack, you know, just the, the tech behind this and the story behind, you know, what you're doing today. Well, what I'm doing today, so is, is related to what I was doing with Super Dynamics, but it takes a turn towards uh, how you and I, and every average person in the world is going to enter into this future digital world. What is the relationship between, between us and that future world? And the business that I'm, um, that I'm developing right now as the president uh, is iVirtual Technologies. And iVirtual was started by uh, one of my uh, oldest friends and somebody I've worked with in the past on a number of projects named Sheriff Care. Uh, and, um, it, and he asked me to join at the beginning of this year as the president, and, um, and I happily, happily did. It, 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 the, the business is designed to um, create an identity management system for average consumers in this future world. And that we see that as t- in two ways. One, you will be represented in this world as a virtual human if you right. are not already right. being represented. Uh, by because you've created some representation of yourself or someone has taken a, a, a representation, has created a representation of you with your consent or without your consent. So you're going to be represented in this world. And secondly, that we believe that everybody should have the right to design their own terms and conditions for how they're represented. So those are the two pillars of iVirtual. The first is we want you to be, become a, a virtual human easily and so um, in September, we're launching uh, a, an app called Heymoji that will allow you to become a virtual, virtualized very easily and start using a virtual representation of yourself in messaging. And that's our first step towards your, what we hope is kind of an easy to access journey for anybody to be virtualized. Wait, can we're I do also- this during Zoom? When, I, when I'm on a Zoom call, can I leave my, my virtual self here and go do something else and, during the meeting? The short answer is, is yes, you will be able to do that. And <laughs> the, the, the other part of it in this sort of the spectrum of virtual human technologies is that almost every major technology company that's interested in this space is doing something inside mm. this space to solve the problem. And so what's the problem well, or what's the opportunity for a lot of these companies? It's that this world is being created where you can go and play and shop and learn and, and, and interact in, in a virtual space. And the assumption is that people will come, people will arrive in these spaces easily, and they will be accurately represented as themselves if they choose to, or they may represent themselves as an avatar, but they, they'll have some control over that. And there are, you know, all the major technology companies at some, some level are interested in this space and they're investing in it. We're you investing in companies. Day. You see gaming oh, companies, gaming companies yeah. huge, huge, yeah. Uh, you know, companies like Epic, um, companies like Roblox, both obviously incredibly successful companies, not only, are, are, are building technologies that will help you to be represented in this world. They're building the infrastructure. I actually see the metaverse as the world's largest infrastructure project. Mm. That is, it is, the, it is a massive digital infrastructure project that's being built by companies like Roblox and, and, and Epic and, um, and Facebook and Google. And um, we're, we're picking a lane in terms of how to build a virtual representation of you. And then we're also doing something that is very new and we think is very, very important. And I can only talk a bit about it. I can't talk about every piece of it. it, it, it I will be in, in a couple of months, mm-hmm. but in September, we'll be releasing a, uh, a product called You Own You, where you'll be able to, in about 60 seconds, does, um, answer some questions and 
literal terms and conditions for how your identity can be used will be generated and attached to your identity. And the basic idea here is that we are forever being asked to accept terms and conditions from the websites and from the seller, right? Right. And we understand why that's required. In fact, there's now government regulations that are increasing the requirements mm -hmm. for cookies and these sort of things. GDRP, well, yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And we're gonna what we're doing is we're gonna turn that around a bit and we're gonna let average people create their own terms and conditions. And we're gonna we're gonna create a, a new paradigm where companies can accept your terms and conditions um, easily. Um, and essentially they can become pre-qualified as a supplier to you. And by mm. pre-qualifying them as a supplier to you, it eliminates a lot of the friction that's involved with constantly asking for your consent. Yep. We want to turn that around and allow people to design their own terms and conditions. And we're going to obey a basic principle here, which is that it's got to be super easy. Mm -hmm. It's going to be fun. And the reality is that a lot of it, look, we know most people don't read the terms and conditions that they accept. Right. Yep. Right. So we, as we turn this around, what we want our community and our members to understand is that we're here to represent them and we're creating terms around privacy, around um, data management, around consent issues that represent their best interests and, um, and that simplify the process of uh, entering this comp entry into this digital world. Um, so um, th that product is called you own you and, and it, uh, the, the feedback we've gotten from investors, we've, we've raised a, a significant amount of capital for this opportunity already. The feedback we've gotten from our marketing partners who are some of the leading marketing agencies in the world, the feedback we're getting from our own legal team who are, who write, who are writing, they have to write this matrix of terms and conditions that, that, that our technology picks from. Everyone has said, wow, this is new, it's timely, and it's important. And, when, and, and um, we thought this idea was, was something that was important, but we're getting so much validation around it that, that we feel that um, when we launch in September, that uh, that really it's just a matter of of of, of when um, we will have enough members to be able to really go into the marketplace and say, here's a new way to do uh, customer uh, identity and access management. Here's a new way for for websites and companies to have a relationship with their customers that's based on trust and authenticity. That's less about targeted marketing and more about alignment of vision and values. Um, and that actually takes, takes me back to this, you know, from why I'm interested in this space and why I'm helping to develop it is, is cause I really believe in this idea that if you can see two really big problems and you know, maybe complicated to solve them, but the, but let's see if we can, let's see if we can do it because why not? Why wouldn't we try to address the big problems? The big mm -hmm. problem here is that, that, that the, 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 the digital economy that relies on acquiring your data with with quasi with a kind of consent or sometimes right. no consent at all that system is is broken mm -hmm. and, and it needs to be replaced and, and it needs to be replaced yeah. for us to do a bet we want to do it for as consumers and also for the websites and and for the for the digital businesses and that that are that have maybe relied on that model too long it, do it they recognize that problem do, do you think like the the corporate vendors, do they, I mean, they, they, they don't care if I read, I mean, does, does Apple care that I read the Apple conditions? I mean, at the end of the day, or, or is this, I think like Apple, you said, is it just developing a deeper relationship, more, more connected? I think, I think Apple, I think Apple truly cares. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, you know, obviously think, with the, their feud with Facebook right now over, over this, you know, a privacy issue, I, I was going to ask you, if, do you see this tracking, you know, with kind of where Apple's trying to, trying to land on this the space well we certainly feel that apple is making our argument for us mm -hmm. um, they declared that privacy is a human right and that you should have the tools to be able to determine how your information is used right we're going to take it a little further so we're not i don't want to over uh, sell or over reveal some of our product uh, features but where apple is saying that you should have the right to control your your privacy and your data we're going to actually create the tools to allow you to do it mm, yeah. and we actually we actually think that most people they want their data to be used to design better products and services so if i was to say in the future if we have another pandemic do you want constant uh you to be able to contact tracing to be something that you can do all the time the answer mm. would be 
Yes, but I don't want the price to be that you are now, um, you have the right to, to surveillance over yeah. me and yeah. my movement. So how do we yeah. sort those two things out? That's something that we mm-hmm. want to sort out. Most people would say, if I could um, donate my medical information to making better uh, therapeutics and better health and better medicines, I would do that. Mm -hmm. But I don't have any trust that if I do that, I'm also not surrendering my personal information. So how do we, how do we separate personal information from valuable data? That's what we plan to do with iVirtual. And as a little teaser, I will say that at iVirtual, when you share your data in a way that is completely, uh, you know, functional and you can't keep your private information, the revenue that's generated from that sharing will be your revenue. We will, we, will, we will return that revenue to our members. And, and this is a, not just a multi-million or multi-billion dollar, this is a multi-trillion dollar industry mm. over the last 10 years. The, the model is based on acquiring data from you and using that data to, to generate um, value for customers. As Facebook rightly says, we create amazing services and, the, and what they're sort of backpedaling on is yes, and the price is that we, we yeah. use your data. Right. And, and, and Apple's saying, well, we, we wouldn't have put ourselves in that situation in the first place. Yes, our, our products and services are expensive, but we don't, uh, we, the fine print, print didn't say we get to use your private information. Mm. We're trying to sort that out a little bit for especially right. starting with average people right. and saying yep. you can own and control with you on you, you can own and control your own data. And, um, and we can start to do what everybody in the economy does, except for us as consumers, which is to have a, a master agreement for how mm-hmm. you, you can interact with me. And when you think, I think back to your message, your, your comment about Star Wars, I'm also from the Star Wars generation. I can remember Star Wars. And I love the fact that they've remained true to, the, to this day, to the idea that nobody carries a smartphone. Nobody carried a smartphone then, they didn't imagine them in 1977. And even today, they're, they haven't allowed themselves to slip in an iPhone into any of the scenes. <laughs> and, and yet the, I, the, 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 the smartphones that we hold in our hands as average people represent so much power mm. in terms of information, in terms of being able to collect and, and communicate data, that to imagine a world, say 10 years ago, to imagine a world where every individual could be managing their relationships with corporations without thinking about it. You go about your right. shopping for shoes and insurance products and you're going, to, you know, hopefully you're going back to the movies someday, you know, maybe, maybe in the States you're doing that now. They're not doing that in Canada yet. Yep. Um, and as it's you're open. doing that, yeah. that's, that's great news. Yep. Um, as you're doing that through the power of a simple device in your hand, you're actually able to manage your relationships in a much, much more effective way. Um, so as we think about what iVirtual can do is to leverage the power of digital technologies to allow average people to enter into a global digital economy mm. and to represent themselves in that economy. Yeah. Let's not forget it's our money that makes the world go round, right? Right. As, you know, it's our money. It's our money that's driving all of the innovations and all of the, a, a lot of the chess pieces that are being moved around in a, in a global, you know, economy is, is usually being driven by what do consumers want? What mm-hmm. do consumers need? So as we yeah. start to help design better products and services, we think that uh, iVirtual is really helping to solve a major problem. I I could not agree more. And I and I and I still, you know, that's it, still I, I know you you've you know held some things back behind the curtain, you know, intentionally and and it'd be interesting to see when it launches. But the when I think back at some of the, you know, you've got a common thread. In, in everything that you've done. I mean, you were CSR before CSR was cool. You know, you were, you were, you, you cared about social good. You cared about doing things that, that had, you know, a social component to them, you know, even from going back to the food delivery. I mean, you, you saw a social problem you wanted to, to attack, you know, but so often these, you know, the, the causes, I guess, that we want to, we want to attack, they are really hard to monetize. They're really hard to, you know, to, to make a good solid business case. And that triple bottom line, we're trying to solve, you know, the, you know, but yeah, we can do the good. We can do the, even the green, but we can't do the financial, you know, side of things. So it seems like to me that you've kind of cracked that nut three times in a row here. You know, the, the whole idea of, you know, this, you, you, we want to be good at what we do. We want to be good for the economy. We want to be good for the planet, you know, and, and good for the society. 
you know, all these together? Well, I'm, I also believe in pragmatism. I, I believe in enlightened self-interest. And I hate to sometimes admit it, I'm kind of a market fundamentalist. I just think that the market is slightly misaligned with the values of people. Mm. You know, if you can align a lot, when I talk about values and of average people, we're talking about basic things like most people want to live in a safe community. Most people want their kids to grow up with opportunity without having to face some injustice along the way. Most people are not you know, cheerleading for corruption uh, or pollution. <laughs> you know, the, the, most people actually want similar things. It's finding how to finding ways to um, attach yourself or your business to those most things mm -hmm. and making them make it easy to access. So um, in, in the case of iVirtual, we think most people want their identity to be safe and secure. And most people would love the chance to influence how corporations are designing products and services in the future. Yep. And, and, and we might think of that as CSR, you know, um, as some sort of responsibility component. But in reality, it's just a more efficient way for uh, us in a market to express uh, the demand and have the reaction of supply. So, mark, you know, supply and demand is a, is a really beautiful idea so long as, you know, as, it, as, as you can actually attach the, 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 the real interests of average people and consumers yeah. to the demand side of things. I think there's just a, right now we see a, a misalignment between what people want and what they get in a digital economy. For example, on Facebook, they, they have got themselves into a little bit of trouble here, obviously. And people love Facebook and they wanted something in, in, in that experience with Facebook. But it, looking back over the last few years, some people have said, well, that's, I got something that was slightly different than what I wanted. Mm -hmm. um, and the mar markets are like that sometimes a, a slight variation between the, what you got and what you asked for sometimes creates inefficiencies. And we, we're interested, I'm very interested in this as an entrepreneur, and we are as a company in trying to close that gap so that people, when they say, you know, here are my terms and conditions, I want the best products and services, but I don't want the price to be a hidden cost or a, what we might call a, a, a negative externality, right? Uh, something that crops up later. Yep. I paid for a product and then I ended up funding a problem. Right, right. I no, for sure. And I, I, I think that, I mean, the way that you've kind of um, explained it to us, it, it sounds like to me that you've, you have looked at this in, in 360, you know, you've looked at all the different angles and, and see a, a real value prop here, but, but tell me what is the, what's the biggest hurdle to scale, you know, for, for this idea, what is the, what's the one thing that would keep you up at night that you're thinking, we're not completely sure we've got this one cracked. Yeah, that's a great question. For iVirtual to take um, to take flight, uh, we we really need to work with inter enterprises that want to work with their customers, and 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 that keeps me up at night in terms of scale. But I absolutely am sure that we'll get there. And that's to say that um, enterprises that want to work on a new a customer identity and access management system that says, okay we're not giving up our own terms and conditions, but we're going to look at the customer's terms and conditions and how can we, how can we be, be a pre-qualified supplier? Um, we're building a whole suite of software that will allow uh, enterprises, small websites, large businesses to be able to, for free, to be able to, uh, to read and, and accept terms and conditions of their customers. But it does keep me up at night on how to execute that piece. Having said that, we live in an era today when it comes to assembling teams um, quickly, that are highly talented, highly experienced. Um, we're, we're living in an era right now where it's, 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 it's far easier today than it was 10 years ago, five years ago to put the teams that we need to execute. So I'm extremely confident that we'll get there. We have now, we have team members now in uh, Lisbon, Boston, Poland, you know, um, Toronto and Thailand. And we're, it, we're, we're really leaning into distributed work. We're really mm -hmm. leaning into uh, to the idea of, 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 of a, uh, a new way of working and a better way of doing business. Right. I, I, um, I know that you see value, I, but is there a steep learning curve for, for companies? I mean, are you having to sell why this is a good idea to Sony, to, you know, BMW, to whoever it is that, that you would be talking to, or do they get it right off the bat? 
I, I think they get it right off the bat. And, um, and the part of the reason is that for the last 20 years, the major corporations have invested heavily in their corporate social responsibility, mm-hmm. and they've tried to turn it into a business model at some level. Of course, the, the CSR part of a large corporation competes often with other interests and often doesn't win that battle. But from a, compa- a capacity building perspective, corporations are incredibly intelligent uh, when it comes to understanding the problems. They don't always do the right thing. Mm-hmm. But I, I, actually, I actually think that we've o- over-personified the corporation as if, it's, as if the corporation is somehow um, thinking, thinking as a sentient being through these right. issues. Corporations are a little more like dogs. And I've run corporations, I love corporations, but they're more like dogs. They, they respond to sti- stimuli, you know, and profit is, is, yeah. is, yeah. And you can train uh, a, a corporation just like you can train a dog to, re- to behave and to be your best friend and to protect you and to provide you with great things. But if you don't, an untrained corporation will seek profit the way that mm. a, cor- a dog will, you know, uh, chew your slippers and, bite the neighbor and, and, and whatnot, you know, I mean, I hate to, uh, that's maybe an analogy that goes a little too far, but my point is that <laughs> my point is that, that, that uh, the cor- corporations um, respond to profit and they've also built up amazing capacity to understand these emerging social and, and environmental problems. Um, and, and most of them are looking for better ways to connect with their customers in an authentic way. And all of them see the risk of a changing IT environment where data needs to be managed in new ways and they no longer they no longer can um under the laws of 130 countries around the world they no longer can take it for granted that that data can can be stored any way they they, they want yeah that i mean there there's no doubt this is an issue there's no doubt it's an issue that needs to be addressed and um and i i know that uh it'll be interesting to see you know just kind of watch the the press clippings that are going to come out you know this fall around the, the things that you're 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 kind of releasing to the market and uh you know into the the iot and and just uh give people a chance to experience this and and really see i mean it'll be interesting to see over the next 18 24 months i mean really what your you know upward right hockey stick looks like as far as growth and adoption of, of this kind of new tech. But um, I, I'm just really anxious to, to see what uh, what the future has, because this is this has been I've, I've done this for three years. This is one of the most interesting um, just ideas that we've ever had on the show, just to, around the, the depth of, you know, what the, the problem you're trying to solve, you know, and and the breadth. I mean, it really is a global potentially a global issue, you know, that you could, that you could solve. And I'm assuming it's got to be in multi-languages and it's got to be, you know, um, very adaptable on an individual basis, but within a certain parameter that says it can't just be anything goes, it has to, you know, fit because it has to be understandable, you know, to the corporation as well. I mean, they have to, they have to know what they're agreeing to, you know, on the backside. I mean, now I just, now, you know, you sign this and now I own GM, you know, um, no, yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. There is a there is a kind of a two way a partnership agreement here, but absolutely. You know, as we're uh, go ahead. I was just coming in. It's going to say uh, that it, that we are in the business of helping to broker that partnership between mm-hmm. consumer and company, yep. and we believe in that relationship. So it's not an adversarial thing at all. Right. And uh, and in fact, we we uh, we see the, uh, the the software we're building for the enterprise as 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 crucial. And so, some we we definitely see the enterprise being able to um, being able to accept terms and conditions very easily. Yeah. Uh, it, it would have to. Yeah. Yeah, 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 absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Yeah. They, they, you know, the, we can get into that in another conversation. Maybe you know, maybe if you wanted to check in in six months and see how things are going, I always love to do that. But absolutely. but from my perspective, the chance to come on this uh, on this podcast and talk a bit about our ideas is great opportunity for us. Um, I think what you're doing is amazing to be able to shine light on entrepreneurship and, you know, I, I, just a, a great pleasure to be a part of the conversation. Well, Chris, I do appreciate that as, uh, as, as we close up today, is there anything that we haven't touched on that you think would just be a, a great, um, kind of a nice golden nugget to leave with our listeners, you know, based on your experience and kind of a, having walked this path in, in, you know, multi dimensions, what's, uh, what's one word of advice that you'd leave with us? Well, I want to go back to that, that issue about leadership. That um, leadership mm. is uh, is something that is uh, that everybody has the ability to to have at some level. And as an entrepreneur, 
there's so many times when you wonder whether or not I can stand up and face this next challenge. Um, and uh, I really just uh, really believe that, that people who are in a situation building something new, look around you and see what your support system looks like, yeah. have conversations about what you're worried about, and then kind of gather that confidence and then lean forward because you, you just, you can't get anywhere from standing still. And um, uh, as an old timer uh, entrepreneur, that's probably been the biggest lesson for me over the last 25 years. What a way to wrap us up today, Chris. Uh, man, I appreciate you taking the time today and I hope that uh, you enjoy your day on on a lovely island in Thailand, but just thank you for sharing the, just your, your story and sharing the, the journey you've walked and the lessons learned and really just the, the whole idea behind what you're trying to launch and just playing your part in helping all boats rise in a rising tide. Chris, have a great day. Thanks so much, Kevin. Take care. Another episode in the books. We hope you heard some great takeaways. Don't forget to subscribe and leave a five-star review on iTunes and YouTube. As always, thanks for listening to Rising Tide.